Hello everyone, and welcome to our sixth bite-sized learning module that we're filming as part of our Modern Slavery Impact Initiative. These are a series of conversations we're having with leading experts throughout Australia, unpacking key modern slavery risk issues for Australian businesses. And the series was, has been made possible by the support of the Australian Government through the National Action Plan to Combat Modern Slavery 2020 to 2025. My name is Chris Gasky, and I look after the Human Rights Programming at the UN Global Compact Network in Australia. And it's my pleasure today to be in Perth to be joined by the Walk Free team to unpack the Global Slavery Index. So to help me do that, um, I'd, like, I'd love to welcome Serena Grant, Head of Business Engagement at Walk Free, and also Elise Gordon, um, Manager for Global Research at Walk Free. Thank you so much for being here, guys. So I just want to start us off because I'm conscious that some people may not have been um, exposed to this before. Serena, if you can just listen, what is the Global Slavery Index? Sure, Chris. So the Global Slavery Index is one of the most comprehensive data sets on modern slavery globally. Uh, since its inception, it's really been designed to answer three key questions, which is how many people are living in modern slavery around the world, what makes people vulnerable, and what are governments doing to respond? Uh, so over the last 10 years, since we've been publishing the Global Slavery Index, we've been able to gain a better understanding of not just where modern slavery is happening around the world, but also uh, what the import risk is, how it's impacting supply chains around the world. And uh, this year is no different. We've started to look more closely at the G20 countries and how they're importing that risk into their supply chains. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the, the key findings from the Global Slavery Index this year uh, have been that, you know, we know the number of people in modern slavery around the world have has gone up. So there's now 50 million people around the world estimated to be living in conditions of forced labour or forced marriage. Uh, that's an increase of around 10 million people since we did the last estimates in 2018. And what the Global Slavery Index does is it takes those numbers and then looks down at the country level to see how many people are living in modern slavery in each country. Uh, that number, we think, is going up for a number of reasons, uh, partly to do with the methodology, but partly also because we're seeing compounding crises around the world. Mm. Uh, we've seen the impacts of COVID-19, the pandemic, and the impacts that that had on vulnerable people. We've also seen displacement due to climate change. We've seen a number of conflicts around the world again, causing migration, displacement. Um, so all of these things increase the risks of, mo of modern slavery to vulnerable groups. And we're really seeing that um, it's not just the intersection of these issues with modern slavery, these, these issues are compounding in themselves to create much more vulnerability. And so this is a separate project to the global estimates, correct? It's a separate assessment. It is, it is separate. So the, the global estimates of modern slavery Walk Free produces with the International Labour Organisation and the International Organisation for Migration. And the regional estimates, which are presented in the, the Global Estimates of Modern Slavery, they're the starting point for the national estimates that we present in the Global Slavery Index. Right. So the Global Slavery Index, also known as the GSI, mm -hmm. is solely Walk Free's work, uh, but it does um, draw on the research that is conducted in collaboration with the ILO and the IOM for the from the global estimates. Gotcha. I mean, th we know that the, the GSI informs so many different um, modern slavery risk interventions all throughout the world. Um, I'm keen to unpack some of the methodologies a little bit. So just, I suppose, starting with that prevalence figure, um, Elise, can you tell me a bit, a bit more about how you get to the number? I can, yes. Yeah. So as I mentioned, the, the regional counts from the global estimates, they form the starting point for our prevalence estimates mm -hmm. that we present in the Global Slavery Index. And uh, so the the global estimates draw on several key pieces of, of information, um, but the core component of the data set is uh, 75 national surveys that we conduct across the world. Um, 71 of these national surveys are conducted through the Gallup World Poll, and four are conducted purely on forced marriage in four countries in the Arab states region. And these are all telephone surveys that, that the surveys conducted in the Arab states region. Uh, in terms of the surveys conducted through the Gallup World Poll, they're conducted either face-to-face -face or by telephone. Uh, and we ask respondents about forced labor and forced marriage. And we ask not only about their own experiences, but also the experiences of their immediate family. So that's their parents, their siblings, their children, and their spouse as well. 
uh, and we're asking about experiences in the preceding five years. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in terms of getting from those regional counts to the national counts, we actually use risk modelling. So the risk modelling takes the, the survey data and it identifies uh, individual level risk factors such as age, gender, income, and it takes the vulnerability scores also presented in the, the Global Slavery Index uh, to um, include country level risk factors for modern slavery. And the, through the modelling process, we um, produce predicted prob probabilities of modern slavery for each country. And we use those to break down that regional, the regional counts for each region to countries within that region. Um, and we do this to allow, to be able to produce estimates, not just for the 75 countries in which we survey, but for 160 countries uh, based on their, their risk. Um, and then once we have apportioned those regional totals, we make some final adjustments to account for state-imposed forced labour, uh, the migration status of a country, so whether it's net receiving or net sending, uh, and also we make some final adjustments for Arab states countries based on some additional surveys that we conducted during the, the period. And just to mention, so all our surveys that we conducted um, were conducted between 2017 and 2021. Mm -hmm. We conduct a minimum of 1,000 surveys per country. Uh, and so because we're asking not only about the respondent but also about their immediate family, we end up with a sample size of almost 600,000. So it's a huge sample. There's so much to unpack there. I have so many questions. Um, I'm just going to start with, so I know businesses are doing a lot of work to try and engage with rights holders more closely and more meaningfully. I'm curious how you guys go about identifying the right person to speak to in these surveys. Like, how do you actually get to that person? Yeah, so these are nationally representative surveys. So okay. we are surveying, surveying people that are 15 years and over uh, and non-institutionalised populations. So that means we're not surveying in orphanages, for example. Uh, we're not sur surveying in prisons. We're not surveying in other care facilities. Uh, and the way that these um, surveys work, uh, so for example, if we're um, uh, interviewing face-to-face -face in a country, we'll have a, t a local team of interviewers who will go out, they will conduct interviews in the main local languages. Um, they will, there is a, in terms of the sample, we cover the entirety of the country in terms of the, the major regions. We sample both urban and rural areas. The households are randomly selected, so teams will um, randomly select households, approach that household, randomly select respondents within that household, uh, and then once they've um, accept, they've uh, said yes that they will participate in an interview, we then proceed and ask them questions about their experiences of forced labour mm -hmm. and forced marriage in the preceding five years. So, for example, we will ask a series of questions uh, about whether there was um, coercion in terms of their working experience. So uh, we will say, for example, uh, in the last five years, have you or anyone in your immediate family been forced to work by an employer or a recruiter? Uh, and we'll ask a series of questions that try to get at that. Um, we're, we're trying to establish that the work was against their will. Uh, and then we ask a follow-up question on the form of coercion. So what what form of coercion was used to um, force them into that work. So was it physical force? Was it threats against themselves or, or a family member? Was it withholding of a passport or other kind of identity document? Um, there are many ways that a person can be coerced into forced labour. So we have those, those key pieces of information. Um, was it against their will and how were they coerced? Mm -hmm. And similarly for forced marriage, we will ask, um, have you ever been have you or anyone in your immediate family ever been forced to marry? Uh, and for those who say yes, um, they or someone in their family have, we will then ask, you know, how, how were you forced to marry? What was the form of coercion? And we also will ask a series of follow-up questions for those uh, who do respond yes to both. They were um, made to work or marry against their will and who um, provide a form of coercion. So, for example, uh, the duration of work and the sector of work. That's fascinating. So I, I have way too many questions than we have time for, but I do want to touch on the Australian um, figures a little bit because I know the the, the Global Slavery Index in uh, 2018, I think the number in Australia was 15,000 for prevalence and the latest one was 41,000, near 41. 
Can you just unpack a little bit how, like, is the situation getting worse or is it sort of a compounding crisis piece? Like, what's driving that increase? Yeah, absolutely. It, and it, it's multiple factors, but absolutely it, the compounding crisis is contributing to that higher number that we're seeing in Australia. Um, the, the estimates produced in the 2023 edition are not directly comparable to our last edition in 2018. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is because there are, have been improvements to the methodology. Uh, there were improvements to the global estimates, uh, including improving the way that we count cases of modern slavery in the country in which it occurred. Um, and that has flow on effects then into the national uh, estimates. Um, we also have a much larger scope. So we're surveying in 75 countries as opposed to 48 countries um, in 2018. Mm -hmm. And so that also has an impact on the figures. Um, so it really is that combination of uh, increasing vulnerability plus um, improved methodology. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, fantastic. Um, so I suppose, Serena, I'm keen to put this into practice for some some of our business participants because mm -hmm. people will see the numbers come out, they know it's an update. Um, there's, there's sort of different totals, different sort of risk criteria. If I'm a business, how can I use this data in sort of a practical way? Sure. So I think um, probably one of the most obvious uses of the data is the prevalence data. So we're telling you what is the likelihood of someone being in modern slavery in these countries. So if you're looking at risk across your operations and your supply chain, typically you would use that data in some form to look at, okay, where are the highest risks and where might I want to take further action, further due diligence to understand what are the practices on the ground. Uh, but I would strongly encourage you not to stop there. Um, I think the Global Slavery Index is so much more than just the prevalence data. And what, what we've got in there, the, the information there in terms of vulnerability, what is driving modern slavery, or the government response data, what are the legal and policy gaps in that country, that can be really informative for businesses to then think about what their response should be. So, for example, if I've got operations in a particular country and I know that my workforce, the demographic of that workforce is predominantly migrant workers, you know, the Global Slavery Index can really help you to understand what are the drivers um, of vulnerability for those migrant workers and how might I respond to that. So I'd, I'd point businesses first to the prevalence data for that, that sort of basic country risk assessment. Uh, secondly, to government response to look at legal and policy gaps, mm -hmm. not just do you have a supply chain law or human rights due diligence law, but also what, what's your um, sort of general rule of law enforcement like? Mm -hmm. um, you know, do you, do you have a response to victims? Are there protections in place? Um, and then Beyond the um, government response data, I think the vulnerability data is, is really interesting to help you understand what's driving the vulnerability in that country. Mm. Um, and then finally, I think at the beginning we touched on some of those compounding crises that we mentioned, really looking at, at some of the root causes that are increasing vulnerability to slavery. So we've got spotlights within the index looking at some of those in more detail. We've also got spotlights on specific industries, so we look at um, risks in the fishing industry. We look at uh, cocoa. There's there's long been um, you know widespread reports of forced and child labour in the cocoa sector. Uh, we also look at social media and the financial sector, which are two new industries that we've looked at. Um, so yeah, I really encourage businesses to have a look at some of the detail around those industries as well as some of those root causes, the essays looking at the crises that are really driving modern slavery. Um, and finally, we've got uh, data on the import risk. So we looked at uh, G20 countries, which are obviously hold the most leverage in the global economy and are buying the most goods and services. And we looked at, you know, what are the actual goods that are at risk of modern slavery that the G20 are importing. Um, so again, I'd encourage businesses to have a look at that and to look at, you can see for each of the G20 countries what the top five at-risk products are. So that's also quite helpful to understand not just what what types of modern slavery are occurring in that particular country, but what goods they might be importing and therefore connected to. Mm. Fantastic. Thanks, Serena. I mean, I'm, this, I have so many more questions um, that I'd love to be able to get through, but unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. Before we wrap, I did just want to say 
an enormous congratulations to you both on all of this work. There's clearly so much work that's gone into this, um, and it's an absolutely amazing tool for businesses and everybody else to use to understand um, where they may be connected to modern slavery. And thank you all very much for watching. Um, if you'd like to learn more about the UN Global Compact, you can visit us at unglobalcompact.org.au. And of course, you can see the updated 2023 Global Slavery Index at walkfree.org slash global dash slavery dash index. Um, and we'll also include links to these in the description box below. Thank you very much, Serena Elise, and we'll see you next time.